These are the planes that won wars. Proud veterans of the days when heroes fought in the skies. They're like time machines. It seems you grab the controls, you've got that instant touch back to the past. In hangars and workshops across Britain, engineers and enthusiasts are fighting a desperate duel against corrosion. It's only glued on. I'm sure it'll be all right. And the clock. I'll be pretty gutted if we don't make it. Their mission? To return historic military aircraft to the skies. The hardest thing is finding the parts. From D-Day vets, to jump jets. As a little lab, you've got mum, 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 can I have another fixed kit? Bloody fantastic. From legendary lifesavers to Edwardian flying machines. I've been told I can only fly it as high as I'm prepared to fall. But it can be an unpredictable business. If we have a catastrophic failure, then come and try and rescue us. You're taking off thinking if the engine stops, we're even a land. I mean, I've had three engine failures. It takes serious money. You need a cool three to six million pounds to get a good spare part. And total dedication. Minus 28. Some of the tools are freezing up. 15 minutes of holding a screwdriver, you can't feel your fingers. This time on Warbird Workshop. The epic battle to return a life-saving helicopter to the skies. The Seeking was in service for about 38 years. We must have rescued many thousands of people. It's a passion project for a team of military veterans determined to put a woman in the captain's seat. We hope to actually inspire lots of other girls to follow it as a career. They said we'd never get a Seeking flying. We have. <laughs> This West Country Riding Centre is an unusual setting for a unique project to preserve Britain's helicopter heritage. So are you going to lift into the hover? Don't yep. go backwards. Okay. Into the hover, turn and right. then backwards. Ground slope and slightly right. For Army veteran Andrew Whitehouse and his partner Jane, life revolves around the rotor blades of their collection of helicopters. Go down that way. From their state-of-the-art commuter aircraft... Lock is locked. 100%. To some of the oldest flying choppers in the world. All happily hangered next to a stable of four-legged thoroughbreds. It's a very odd mix, but my passion is horses. Andrew's passion is helicopters. My passion has grown into helicopters as well. So we put up a building that houses the both of them. Historic Helicopters team of engineers have just returned this 1960s Westland Wessex to the sky. But now, they have their sights set on an even more ambitious restoration. An ex-RAF Sea King, six tons of lifesaver built in the 1970s. Rescued from the scrapyard and trucked in, corroded, worn out and redundant. It's ended up here all because of Andrew. It's his passion for saving vintage aircraft and keeping them flying that's brought us all to this hangar. RAF veteran Dave Wells will be in charge of the year-long project. All the guys here have uh, got a lot of seeking experience and they're just great to work on. They're a proper boys' toy. They're rebuilding an aircraft that made history. From the Falklands War to the Piper Alpha disaster, the Sea King's pretty much an iconic aircraft for uh, the RAF search and rescue, a massive part of the British forces for over 40 years. The Sea King was designed in America and became famous for winching NASA astronauts from the Pacific after their capsules splashed down. The first men on the moon flew home in one, as have several US presidents. But this RAF Sea King had a far more serious, if less glamorous, job. 597 spent 25 years with 22 Squadron, rescuing yachtsmen in trouble, struggling swimmers, and downed RAF pilots from the sea. Several experts have told the team restoring her will be impossible. Power, test. Oh! Nothing. The first task of the restoration is to try to bring its long, dormant instrument panel to life. 
We tried to put power on the aircraft. Uh, it's been sat in storage for three years, just over three years. This generator will reveal how much of the Sea King's electronics can be revived. We're going to put some DC on. Usually turn the aircraft on with batteries and then put the AC on. Because we haven't got the batteries, so obviously they're removed for storage. Um, what we're going to do is put DC on, which then gives us the hold off relays, which means we can then get external power on. That's the plan. It's a nostalgic day, especially for Andrew, whose personal passion project has now turned into a small business. But there's already a problem. So this is the first time this aircraft's had power on probably for just over three years. Might have a bit of gyro seizure. According to the artificial horizon, the helicopter's upside down. If you sat like that and we are level, it may just be some crap on the connectors and stuff like that. We can start doing functionals, and then from that we can start doing fault diagnosing. Some instruments are missing, others are broken, but that won't deter the team. It's like if you leave a car sat dormant for three and a half years and anything else, you know, you don't know what you're going to get and what's, what's there. Um, yeah, most stuff seems to have fired up. Months of engineering lie ahead, but electronically, the 597's in good shape. Bar warning port. <laughs> Undercarriage. Even the computerised warning voice is working. That will go through a fire warning port, fire warning starboard, undercarriage, um, master caution. Jane's going to fly it at the end of the day. She best sit here. The auto, She's got um, auto hover's working. Undercarriage. It's talking we'll to us. Into the hover then. Should be back. Yes. yes. I might let the boys do the test fly in there. Several female RAF pilots flew Sea Kings before their retirement, but Jane aims to be the first civilian to fly one. For decades, six RAF bases covered the whole of the UK's coastline, along with Navy and Coast Guard units, most operating Sea Kings. They flew up to four times a day, and the public took them to their hearts. No seaside lifeboat day or beach weekend was complete without a fly past. Go! It's three months since the team started work, and it's a landmark day in the hangar. 597 is being hauled out for the biggest job of the restoration so far. Today's plan is to uh, fit this engine. Uh, this is the number one engine, which goes on the port side, and it connects up with two bolts at the back, which slide into a gimbal, two bolts at the front on the inboard, and there's one on the outboard side. And that's all that holds this engine in. Less than five feet long, the two Rolls-Royce turboshaft engines are the only things that keep six tons of helicopter in the air, but they're not high tech. This engine is a gnome turboshaft. It's 1,300 horsepower. Um, it powers most uh, Westland heli uh, old school Westland helicopters and it's been in service for 50 or 60 years. Yeah. Fitting them is a demanding, delicate task for the team. The two gimbal bolts at the back have got um, a sharp stepped end, so they have to be perfectly in line because they're a uh, close tolerance fit. And they either go straight in or they'll take forever. They've got used to improvising when it comes to big jobs like this. If it was a big company, we would have an A-frame and a gantry and all the staging around it, but we don't have that luxury. Andrew made his money from forklift trucks, and one is coming to the rescue today. All right, what we're going to do is hook it on here, lift it, lift it up two inches, right? Move it this out of the way. Me and you'll pull this out of the way and get rid of it, and you just support the engine, yeah? All right, if you lift up the back, Tom, because it's going to tip a little bit, all right? I mean, you take this out, Jamie. Right, your way. The engine is fragile. Right. And cost £50,000. Down slowly. The 200 kilo jet there. must be lowered precisely into the engine bay. It might drop, be careful. Down about an inch. Happy? Happy. Down about an inch. Half an inch. Quarter of an inch. All right, up, touch, 
back, half a hole, back a millimetre, ah, don't move, don't move, it's almost there. The mounting lugs on the engine and the matching holes on the helicopter must be perfectly aligned to the nearest millimetre. Could you uh, push this side down a touch, Mickey? So inboard down. Um, oh, hang on a minute. Let me know. So inboard, inboard up. That's close. Not the other the bolt. Ah, I'm stuck. All right, we'll go in. I've done it before. <laughs> but one of the mounting bolts slips from Dave's fingers. Bollocks! It's a vital part, and until they can find it, this delicate operation is on hold. At Historic Helicopters, engineer Dave and the team are struggling to retrieve a dropped bolt from the Sea King's engine bay. There's a pipe right in front of the hole. Hold steady. Hold steady. Now it's been found, it must be fitted into a hole deep in the engine bay. Give it a twist. Yep, that, that one's in. Finally, the engine and the helicopter are reunited. Oh, I've got it. No, it's the same. Like sometimes they go straight in, and sometimes they won't. But there are still two more bolts to go in. Oh, it's gone straight through. Yeah, yeah, as easy as that. That's now in. Um, it won't fall out. We'll put it back in the slot and then tighten everything down. Right, push. The Sea King is slowly coming back to life. Come on, make sure. But there's still a long way to go. It's been so much easier than the Wessex because it's so much newer. It hasn't sat for 30 years, so it's not corroded, and everything's been really good, and all the spares are available. The team are preparing to move on. But the next phase is going to be difficult and dirty, overhauling the fuel system. All these pipes have got clips on them, so they all clip together. So sometimes they, they've got to go through a really quite a small hole. So you've got to try and keep them away from each other as much as you can, which, which is quite challenging actually, especially because they're all rigid pipes. It's not like they're flexible and you can just go where you want with them. Fozzy is enduring a deep dive into the fuel tanks themselves. Yeah, you've got to be um, quite slim, quite flexible, and have long arms if necessary. It's not the nicest job, but um, it's got to be done. They hold more than 3,000 litres of jet fuel, or one engineer. Whew. Getting high in the air, actually. Fozzie's fighting fuel residue and fumes, but he must inspect every inch of the rubberized tank walls. We used to do this on um, Visa 10s, so we used to do six weeks at a time in there, which is not much fun, but we got paid to slightly extra money for doing it, which was almost worthwhile because you'd end up getting quite bruised. I can say, I call this one the coffin. I feel like Nosferatu in here. On the top deck, the rest of the team are working on the transmission system that will link the engines and the giant rotor blades. Connecting up the high-speed shaft bolts. These are the ones that spin, so these uh, have to be quite critically balanced. They just pull the uh, input coupling and the drive shaft together. Sea Kings were notorious for vibration. It's vital everything is balanced correctly. Take that out, put that inside it, and yeah. do it back up again. The team's apprentices are working on the tail rotor. Was one on the top there? They come for hands-on experience from a local college. It's brilliant. Like at college, we, we work on small jets and stuff like that, but it's nothing like working on a real aircraft, so it's awesome. In the hangar, a lifetime's engineering expertise is being passed on to a new generation in return for some much needed labour. Obviously there are certain tasks that we won't ask them to do, um, but a supervised task like putting a fairing on is fine. There's really no place to get hands-on experience in the industry without actually doing the job. So to do this, they can get a bit of hands-on and little top tips as per. The Sea King was among the first helicopters to have an onboard computer. Its electronics are vital. I'm connected up the electrical um, side of the engine. 
thermocouples, three engine services plug, which supply most of the electrics. You've got the anti-ice pressure switch for connecting up, the igniter plug for getting the lads to connect the earth in and the bonding leads up. It's a good job for those guys to do. Ian then will come and 100% check my work, and then we we'll get Matt in to 100% check his work and my work. So Lives will depend on this work. Most things on an engine fit need three signatures. Um, a, a, a routine panel fit, say like Dave's doing now, just needs one more oversee. Anything that affects the flight control of the aircraft, basically, needs three signatures. Vibration can loosen untightened bolts or fasteners and cause an unsurvivable crash. Anything loose over time could potentially have a significant impact on the aircraft. So, um, yeah. So it's important that three of us have a look. Three people are happy, you should be, it should be okay. It will be okay, three people are happy. This will have an incredibly bad day. <laughs> yeah. When 597 was delivered, it had been stripped of many parts and her rotor blades. And now the team are about to hit another major landmark. We're very close to the finish. The um, final engine's gone in today. The tanks will be finished by Friday. So by Friday, it will be complete, uh, apart from blades. So the next stage next week is to fit the main rotor blades that will weigh the aircraft, and then we'll put fuel in it and start the engines. It's soon after dawn, and it's another big day at historic helicopters' crowded hangar. The Sea King is about to be reunited with its huge rotor blades. It's a bit of hangar Tetris. We have to juggle stuff around to get it all to fit. So what we're doing now is we're preparing to get the Sea King out, and then we'll jiggle around and put the whirlwind back in, and then we'll bring the blades out one at a time and fit them to the head. There's no time to waste. We've got a weather front coming in around lunchtime. If that doesn't beat us, we hope to fire up the number one engine and automatically fold the blades when we're finished to put it back in the shed. The five blades must keep six tons of helicopter in the air. It's crucial they are fitted properly. You've got a 27 foot blade at 15 feet on a forklift. And we've got to line it up perfectly flat to the end of the cuff. So I lift it up in front of the door, get it as close as I can, they'll line it up from up there, and then I'll track it into touch. The team are once more depending on creative use of a forklift truck. It is a delicate balancing act of getting a two flush faces together, and they are very close tolerance fit. It's a risky operation. First time we've ever done it like that. Uh, we normally have the luxury of a big crate. Balancing a 28-foot blade on top of a forklift at 15 feet, everything go wrong. Make a couple of adjustments up there. Put the bolts in, ring of bolts, 10 bolts, and then we'll unhook it and lower the stand away, and it should stay there all on its own. Go on, you can do it. Well done. At last, the first blade is in place, just in time for a call from the boss. Good morning, Andy. Uh, fitting blades. Right. Plan, it, the plan weather's good till just gone after lunchtime. It's absolutely dead calm at the moment. Four more blades to go. Any slight misalignment will cross the bolt, which you don't want to do. Oh, hold a bit. If we slightly knock the blade, you're going to damage it, which means basically writes it off. It's more tricky for Dave driving the forklift and for these guys up here. Everybody else, we're just there to sort of observe and, and assist. What should you do? Should you grab a quick Cut yeah. and then crack on because yeah. I'm conscious of the fact when you get here with the scales, we just need to crack on with it. Yeah, we do, yeah. Next task is putting the Sea King on the scales, a vital step in preparing her to fly again. Support for the pilot. If he doesn't know the weight of the aircraft, then he doesn't know sort of what power he's got at his disposal. That's it, that's a naught. Don't jump on, Mick. The helicopter must be precisely placed on the scales by hand. Ahead. Brakes on. They can now get the figure they need. Uh, 30,600 pounds, approximately, which is quite light for seeking. Six tons. She's about to get heavier. Put some fuel in it, fire up the number one engine at least, and automatically fold the blades. Uh, we've got a problem. We know how much fuel we've put in, but we're not yeah, getting that on the gate. Just dragging that down, but if that happened in flight, it would be serious. 
That's why we do the test now, so we don't get to that situation. After years gathering dust, the fuel system is showing its age. What we've basically got, as soon as we put voltage onto the gauge, it drives it down. We think we might have a semi-problem with the gauge because then we transpose the gauges and showing the right hand set as 300 pounds. We know we've got 500. Despite their concerns, they're going to try to start the engines. Three, two, one, go. Oh, we've got a pissing leak. Oh, shit. Yeah, it's from the fuel feed. OK, power off up. Fuel is dripping from the roof. So we need to get a whole new kit? Yeah, we need a new pipe. Yeah. We had fuel coming in through the cabin from a main fuel feed pipe that goes up into the engine from the tanks underneath. And over it's a union that needs nipping up, but it looks like it might be the pipes porous, which is really going to put us back. Job's changed, and we haven't got a new one right now. Andrew has arrived to supervise. They're going to try to bypass the leak by cross feeding fuel from another tank. Once I've started it, I say I'll give it uh, 10 seconds and then I'm going to flick on a booster pump. It's uh, a bit of added excitement. OK. So, we ready? Ready outside. Ready inside. Three, two, one, go. Dave's starting the number one engine. Oil pressure, 20% into the gate. A series of explosions is accelerating the turbine up to speed with unexpected results. Okay, that's gone. We've got fuel leak. We've got light up. Got light up. It looks like the leak's getting worse. And the engine's now red hot. The engine's still going, smoking a bit, but well, it's still fine. Uh, it's 30. I'm going to nudge it forward a bit, because I don't think the ground is a bit low. Yeah, there's a lot of waste fuel coming out the chamber as well. OK, fuel leak go. has stopped. Dave's shutting down the engine. And that shut itself down. Yeah. Starting to buy with Firex. Disaster reverted. Dave and the team have a lot of work to do. It was in August 2004, in the Cornish village of Boscastle, that the Sea King wrote its last major page in the history of air sea rescue. Floodwaters from a freak storm swept through the village, destroying more than a hundred homes and businesses. You know we've got two on the end of that building, don't you? Yeah, but the other building's collapsing. Steve Ward was a navigator winch operator on one of five helicopters scrambled to the village. Roger, you are clear. That's five and left. We're committed, okay. caps. Oh, Four and left. Three and left. Oh, I'm visual. The Navy and RAF crews saved many lives that day. Now retired, Steve's about to be reunited with one of those Sea Kings. We had six months because we had a major service. We'd take the tanks out, we had to take the floors up. And um, because we know we we're always going to look after them, we set them up as best we can. For sure. It should last, looked after forever. Steve's job was to navigate the crew to the casualty and then lower the winchman. And the, the commando ones, what are they like, corrosion wise? They're, they're better than the threes, obviously, because they didn't do sea work. No, yeah. This is a trip down memory lane for Steve, who helped save countless lives at sea. So this would be my home for the 20 odd years that I was flying the aircraft, kneeling here, looking after the winchman below me and winch operating handles just to my left and little computer joystick. So one hand operating the winch, the other hand manoeuvring the aircraft. It means hanging out of the door in a safety harness. Is this your slip fit, is it? I can just get it on. Not many people could get that on, you've done well. <laughs> If I needed to get out of it quickly, it's as quick as that. And there's nothing funnier than watching a winchman jump out the back without <laughs> taking his harness off. Yeah. Because your feet can just about above the ground. And you're hanging there, and the only thing you can do is come back up, to, or, or if you can get hold of it. And it's always in front of a crowd. It wasn't just the winchman whose life was in Steve's hands. He was responsible for helping the pilots fly blind in all weathers. Here it is, all the instruments that I'm familiar with, the radio controls. 
Yep, yeah, that was my foot straight on the transmit button. I knew exactly where it was. Got one screen for the radar and the other screen for the video camera or thermal imaging camera. Um, the, the radar really was only suited to going over water and that was a big part of our role was to go out over the sea at night. If the pilots couldn't see where they were going then uh, they would rely on me to provide radar steerage. Dozens of RAF Sea King crews were decorated for their bravery. For people lost at sea, they were often the only hope of survival. Sometimes if we were out in a, a search, you, you actually can put your hand and head right into the window so you can look directly below the helicopter. Like most of his colleagues, Steve's now retired. But the Sea King will be a flying memorial to hundreds of brave airmen and women who, like him, flew and maintained them. They included most of the restoration team, who have found a surprising reminder of their part in her past. This aircraft has been on the fleet for quite some time. Everybody here has worked on it at some stage. If I worked on it in the Falklands, 2003, and Foz found a panel that we'd replace with our names on it inside the nose. Today, they're setting up 597's rotors to turn again. By the end of today, we will have hopefully tracked the main rotor blades, tracked the tail rotor blades and balanced them. Today is the last hurdle before getting it back in the air. But even now, any one of a thousand faults could set them back days or even weeks. It's absolute unknown quantity. It could be anything. It could be from a, a duff switch to another fuel leak like we had before. I mean, the whole aircraft's been apart and back together. Test pilot Steve Daniels will be at the controls. The stakes are high. There is still risk involved in what we're doing today, so I want everyone to be aware of the key risks. I want everyone to be aware of their own responsibilities if something should go wrong. And I want everyone to be aware that they could be the key part of the chain which stops something going wrong, OK? So it's a really significant day. We're all ready for it. We've had the safety brief and we're going to walk out now and uh, get the aircraft going. We're not actually going to do a flight, but uh, the aircraft is prepared. OK, so we've got radio comms with uh, Jane. Loud and clear for everybody. Oh, you're cloudy beer. Yeah. Fire test. Yeah, four. Fire four. warning, port. Good. Firewall valve on. Start a button pressed for two seconds. Start a button pressed. 1001, 1002, and now we're going to spread the blades. Okay, so Clear we are ready. Left and right. Clear outside. The ready, on. The Sea King was designed for use on American aircraft carriers, so its rotor blades fold for easy stowage below deck. And we went two are moving. Yeah, Second wild. starboard is moving now. It's time to turn them for the first time in years. The failure now could set them back weeks. OK, it's so on ready. So first time this has been done for a few years. Clear outside to engage. OK, Lewis definitely down, brakes are on. I'm ready. OK, everyone happy? Happy. OK, three, two, one. Red brakes coming off now, gently. Blades are turning. Blades are good. Red brakes have gone out. Advancing, we're using 40 to 60, torque there. That padding is normal, don't worry about that. So that looks good, re-advancing, I'm passing 90% NR, approaching 98. That was a good, normal start, I didn't see anything unusual about that start. And I'm bringing the number one speed to that lever back. To the ground idle position, and we don't lose the generators. The Sea King has passed its last test before flight. Well, that was fine. The aircraft performed really well. She's, uh, it was as if she'd last flown last week. The anti-icing valve isn't working. A booster pump light wasn't coming on, which is a uh, pressure switch tri trivia. 
the flight test schedule that you have to go through is very lengthy. It's got a lot of functional checks to be done in addition to the normal checks that the pilot would do. And if you're doing them cautiously and progressively, which we are, then you're taking your time over them and, and making sure that you're doing the checks right. Everything worked as advertised, so that's as smooth as I've ever seen. Um, and we've got one adjustment on number two engine to make for our flight idle stop. That, and that's it, which is unheard of really. Excellent day. She's almost ready for takeoff. We can't do the first hover today uh, because of a paperwork issue, but uh, at that point we'll stop. But that'll probably take us the rest of the day. In Cornwall, retired navigator winch operator Steve Ward has come to Boscastle on a nostalgic trip to meet some of the people who were rescued by Sea Kings. The call had gone out for as many available assets in the southwest of England to come down to Boscastle because there were so many people needing to be rescued. On our way down here, the weather was really treacherous. Came up the river, there were already two helicopters in place. This river was really badly flooded and the water level at the time was up almost to the roof level of these buildings. And there were cars being swept down the river, some of them with the hazard warning lights on, some with headlights on. Our concern was that there might be people in them being swept out to sea. Still people on the roof. John's low on fuel, so he's going to be poking off some more than fairly soon now. We could see some people on roof, really, of the Riverside Hotel, and we winched them up to the helicopter and then had a look round to see where else there were people. Winching in, Ron, winching in. Too strong. They're nicely clear. Marooned on the top floor of the village shop with a number of guests were local hoteliers Pete and Margaret Templer. We found a skylight had been opened and we started winching people Second one going into a strong right one forward. We lifted in the first occasion uh, 19 people. Right one only. The building that we were evacuating was, was going to collapse. The, <clears throat> the water pressure against the far end of the building s seemed to be horrendous. We were having to winch quite high from the building so that if anything untoward did occur, we could go forward and down and go and land on the water. How much height have we got at the moment? 125. We as a crew um, winched 55 people out of the village. If the Sea Kings or the rescue helicopters hadn't have been here or been able to come and help, potentially many lives could have been lost. Then it would have been catastrophic. Today, Bus Castle has been rebuilt at a cost of 15 million pounds and the Templars are here to meet the man to whom they owe their lives. I was in the kitchen when the water came round my feet. I thought, whoops, <laughs> I need to get out of here. It was coming in the front door on the back door. One of our chambermaids, bless her, she was at the back sweeping with a brush to push to get out, but it was, it was then I upped her away, so we came out of the riverside and up to the building here, and that's where we got rescued from. 150 people were winched to safety by Sea Kings that day one of the biggest rescues in the history of the RAF and Royal Navy. Hello. You Hello. haven't changed at all. <laughs> I, I can't believe, actually, that you recognise me from uh, how I would have appeared with my helmet on. And you were a set. bit busy that day. Well, oh, you're very bad. I tell you what, we can't thank you enough for what you guys done. It was absolutely amazing. It was the, a The real... skill, the determination, <laughs> There was a visitor centre, yes. and if you guys hadn't have been there, those people would have definitely perished. Well, the vi visitor centre Because shortly was, afterwards, we saw the whole it thing collapsed. collapse. Yeah. It, it was a great concern to us that the building was going to collapse and everybody in it was going to be lost. So we well, were trying to evacuate people as quickly as we could. And everybody was so grateful for you guys that day. Well, we're just pleased that we were successful in achieving the aim and getting everybody out. Well, without you, any well you did. You've done the first, first, first class job. Yeah. Absolute first class. Pleasure. OK. When the RAF search and rescue squadrons were disbanded, 
the Coast Guard took over their job with more modern helicopters. But the distinctive sound of the Sea King is about to return to the Cornish coast. The intention today will be the first hovers uh, and the first up and away flying. Uh, bear in mind the aircraft hasn't flown for several years, but this won't be as uh, potentially risky as we had with the Wessex because last week the Grand Run was near perfect. Former RAF pilot Isla Holdham is joining the team for the Sea King's first flight. Her experience could be vital. This is the first time this aircraft will have hovered and flown for a few years. So just everybody please be aware of the potential risks in that. Uh, if we have a problem with a catastrophic failure and heaven forbid a blade comes off, let the movement of the aircraft die down and then come and try and rescue us in the vehicle. It's a sobering warning for the team. Have you had your tea? No, not yet. Not allowed tea yet. I'm not sure. There's excitement in the air. The stakes are high. Okay, so are we all good to start, everyone? Good. Yep. Three, two, one. Now, green light's on, red light's on. Steve's planning to stay low in case there's a problem. OK, everyone happy? Clear left, clear centre, clear right. Clear outside, right clear to engage. Right. Everyone happy inside? Inside, yeah, clear. And engaging. Rotor brake's coming off, nice gentle engaging with the rotor brake. There she goes, blades are turning. Might see a little bit of blade sailing. Ten years after her last rescue, the Sea King is ready to return to the skies. We know what we're going to do, we're going to lift from here. I'll then take the brakes off, and we're going to move forward and right over the grass and sit over the grass. So first take off in a while, just have everybody treat it with caution. Clear above and behind. OK. All right, we're good to go. Up we come. Remember what I said about tail rotor failure, Andrew. If I call speed selects, you grab those speed selects and you pull them straight back. Okay? Yeah. She's airborne. The Sea King is already in demand for public appearances. It's another one of those iconic aircraft. Anybody living near the coast or by the coast would have seen a yellow Sea King at some point in their lives. It has got a massive following, so the quicker we can get it out into the public um, and take it round tour it, the better really. But first it must pass its first test flight. That was so smooth. The track's good, the vibro's good, everything's good. All the figures are good. There's a couple of lights that don't work, but that's it. For Andrew, it's a personal triumph. They said we'd never get a Sea King flying. Oh, we have. <laughs> a few days later, at historic helicopters, the whole fleet is put through its paces, including the venerable Westland Wasp and the 1960s Whirlwind. At the moment, Andrew and Steve Daniels, chief pilot, are going off to do Steve's CAT or type rating for the whirlwind. And Steve will then brief with Jane and start her flying training as a qualified seeking female pilot. For Jane, this is a daunting day. She's used to flying much smaller helicopters. Today is going to be my first training flight in the Sea King. Um, I've completed my simulator training, and um, so next step is to actually fly the Big King himself. Test pilot Steve will be instructing her. So uh, you'll do the takeoff. We'll then lift from the field, get you used to where all the instruments are, so that um, you get used to where the instruments and the switches are. Jane and Andrew are hoping to turn the Sea King into a trailblazer for women pilots. Eventually, it will fly to air shows with an all-female crew. There's a lack of female pilots in the aviation industry full stop, and we hope to actually inspire lots of other girls to um, follow it as a career. To have an all-female crew as part of the historic helicopters team will be a good advertisement for women in the air. Uh, it'll be a good advertisement for us, but my role in it is to train Jane from scratch, basically. She hadn't flown the Seeking before. Jane is taking on a six-ton monster designed before she was born. 
So when you do a seeking walk round, you always start at the door. Look, see, there's nothing obviously hanging off. Her maiden flight is about to hit the local news. I feel very privileged to be in a situation where I can be doing this. We are ready. You can think that yeah. you want to push that and then push that button. Hold it for two, isn't it? Yeah, hold it for two. And we should have 50 to 66, not about 500, over 15, over 25. So you can take your hand off it now. I think the biggest thing with female pilots is opportunity. I'm lucky I've got the opportunity and believe I can do it. Gently off, there you go, blades are turning, push it forward, make sure it's fully housed, then hand on here. And now, well, you're following the torque gauge, just here, I'm going to set 40 to 60. Jane has flown several smaller helicopters and built up hundreds of hours of flying time, but this is a whole new level. Now you can make that switch to fly, and that couples up both engines to the rotors. The RAF spent two years training pilots to prepare for their first flight in the Seeking. I wait five seconds, so the, the mantra is flight drive, wait five. Jane's training course has been rather shorter. Right, you ready for your first takeoff? Yeah. Okay, so I'll help you but lift the lever now. That's good. And there we are, lift the middle of the hover. That's good. That's good. Hold is there. We want to be about 10 to 15 feet. That's good. That was all you. And just establish a stable hover there. I want you to climb vertically and then you'll gently transition forward, okay? Yeah. Using 75% torque at the moment. So pull to about 80. That's good. Gently transition forward. If we have a cigarette failure now, we're going into the field beyond those hay bales. Okay. So let's turn right. PPs are all good. We're using 70% torque, and there's your airspeed, look at that, beautiful, 70-70. You're, you're an expert already. She's nice. Yeah, she's big, she's uh, nearly 9 tons when we took off. After less than 30 minutes, Jane's on her way back to the helipad. OK, your two landing jets are good, and you've got gear down two green. 16 knots. And there's your rad out, you see, so you can just reduce speed as required below 500 feet speed. She's passed her first lesson with flying collars. Here comes the hero of the hour. Yay! No, check me out. <laughs> well done, well done, Jane. <laughs> that was long enough. Not yet. Not yet. <laughs> Oh my God, that was amazing. Absolutely awesome, loved it. I'm glad it was only half an hour. That was enough for my first go. <laughs> Soon, she'll be pairing up with her female captain and winch person. Well, I've got to get qualified first with Steve before we can go anywhere else. So that's the, that's the next target. Soon, the nostalgic sight and sound of Jane seeking will become familiar to holidaymakers on the South Coast. 597, has performed her last rescue, but flies on as a flying memorial to the men and women in uniform who made the shores of the UK a safer place and brought hope to communities like Boscastle.